Thanks, Russ, and uh, thanks for putting this together. And we do have a good attendance. That's fantastic. OK. So you've all heard about PCSK9. You probably also know that the guidelines have been revised yet again. Not terribly revised, but a little bit. And uh, perhaps a little more simple in that we have statin-indicated uh, conditions, anyone with any kind of atherosclerosis, so almost everybody we treat here. But you know, a number of other uh, uh, phenotypes, AAA, uh, most diabetics, chronic kidney disease, so that's new. And of course, anyone with an LDL above five, irrespective of other risk factors, irrespective of age. But you know, beyond that, the guidelines hadn't changed very much. So for those where treatment is indicated, whether um, very high LDLs in primary prevention or, or people with uh, other uh, comorbidities, the target has remained at less than 2.0. So there's a lot of argument around that. Less than 2.0 or a 50% reduction, which is what you get with a potent statin. So many people on the panel were disappointed that we didn't have tougher, more vigorous targets for those who were higher risk. But in the small print, we do have this. So uh, this is in the CJTC article on the basis of, of improvement. Remember improvement, ACS, uh, this is uh, Pravacol versus uh, atorvastatin. And those individuals with ACS who achieved an LDL less than 1.0 actually did the best in terms of uh, recurrent events over a, a subsequent period. And, and really indicating this very high risk in individuals that lower is better, you can say, well, maybe it should be less than one. But in any case, the guidelines do say less than 1.8 for high risk. And of course, many of us try to get numbers even lower if we can do that uh, readily, readily, easily. So obviously, the treatment, you know, you want to upregulate LDL receptors by decreasing hepatic free cholesterol. So statins are the way to do it. But we do have data for azetamibe. We do have some data for bilocid sequestrants. And of course, we have to remember that diet is also effective, just reducing saturated fat, increasing polyunsaturated fats will upregulate LDL receptors. So we've had a lot of data over the course of the last many years showing that irrespective of the level of risk, irrespective of baseline cholesterol levels, overall a 20, there's a 22% reduction in events, 10% reduction in mortality for each one millimole reduction in LDL. And of course, most of the therapies we use today lower LDL by at least two millimoles per liter. And of course, if you throw PCSK9 inhibitors in there, it's much more. And of course, what we don't know yet, will this paradigm hold up when we get down to those extremely low levels of cholesterol? And I think we will know that fairly quickly. What this means is that for the vast majority of patients when you, you uh, decide that they are eligible for a statin, it means using a very potent statin. So as tolerated, the highest doses of azubastatin or the highest doses of atorvastatin. Azubastatin, marginally more effective, but these, of course, are both good drugs. And this is really necessary for most patients with acute coronary syndromes, but also for many of the other patients, even if they have relatively <laughs> stable uh, coronary disease. And of course, beyond improvement, we know from a number of studies, TNT, 10 milligrams of atorvastatin versus 80 milligrams of atorvastatin. Once again, getting down to an LDL less than 1.6, there was incremental benefit. And that was about as low as we got with statin monotherapy in those days. And even in primary prevention, in the Jupiter study, the individuals achieving an LDL less than 1.3 did better. So applies to primary prevention as well. So statin, I think, you know, we're talking about PCSK9. Statins, of course, are the cornerstone of therapy. And they are very effective. So the highest doses of resuvastatin, almost as effective as a PCSK9 inhibitor. So you're getting uh, upwards of a 60% plus reduction in LDL cholesterol, a TORF a little bit less. Sometimes with some patients who are difficult patients who have side effects, we have to go back to some of the earlier statins, but you know, nonetheless, you can do pretty well even with pravastatin 40 with a second agent like azetamide. So uh, statins are the cornerstone of therapy. It is, of course, true. When you double the statin dose, you get about another 6% reduction in LDL. So you know, there's a law of diminishing returns, but uh, the higher doses, nonetheless, do work better. 
I think something also very important to remember is do not stop a statin in a very high-risk individual. This is an old paper published, it was from the PRISM study, published in CERC in 2002, and individuals with ACS who had not been on a statin prior to event and weren't starting the statin had a much higher event rate than those who came in and were in a statin and the statin was continued. What was very interesting in this study, patients who were on a statin at the time of ACS and it was discontinued at that time had almost a threefold increased three-day event rate. So don't stop statins unless you absolutely have to. Uh, and uh, I think particularly for these high-risk individuals, it's really important to, to emphasize this, the risk associated with stopping a statin in a high-risk ACS individual. Well, beyond statins, uh, we do have other agents. Ezetimibes, <coughs> easy trial has been around for many, many years, and unfortunately for many, many years didn't have any RCT data, and as it came off patent, it had some fairly decent data. But we do have uh, information, ezetimibe, cheap drug, is <coughs> incrementally uh, beneficial beyond the statin. We have some data in bioelastic sequestrants. Um, Lodialis is expensive if you're less than 65. If you're on ODB, it's the price of azetamide, so still worth considering. Fibrates have some role in severe hypertrichosridemia. Niacin, well, no, value, no added value of LDL is less than 1.8, as in the HPS2 Thrive study. And of course, now we have PCSK9 inhibitors. So um, I think for a number of years, people were somewhat reticent to use azetamide really, I guess, because there wasn't RCT data, but uh, I think the improvement study is important. Individuals who start off in an LDL 1.8, azetamide gets them down to about 1.4, and of course, the PCSK9 inhibitors will do better, and uh, that resulted in overall about a 10% reduction in, you know, the major event, CV, de CV death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke. So, I mean, not a, not, Terribly remarkable, but you know, for a cheap drug, this really is not too bad. So, PCSK9 inhibitors. PCSK9 is, is really kind of a wonderful uh, drug target, and it's, it's unfortunate that it's not very druggable in the usual sense. So, uh, this is a slide from Amgen, but I think it's really very good. Taking you back to medical school, I think most of you remember the uh, the story for which Brown and Goldstein got the Nobel Prize, understanding how the LDL receptor regulated uh, plasma levels of cholesterol. So, of course, LDL particles circulate, they bind to LDL receptors on the liver, and the receptor in the LDL goes into a early endosome that is transferred to a recycling endosome. And at this point, the paradigm was that, well, the LDL receptor circulates back to the plasma membrane of the hepatocyte, and the cholesterol goes to a lysosomal compartment for degradation. And uh, that was a nice story. But then we started to realize that, you know, the kinetics really didn't fit. And then uh, a long story that involved uh, Nabil Seda in Montreal. These individuals were identified who had very high cholesterol levels but did not have mutations in the LDL receptor, ApoB. And it was finally discovered that what they had were gain of function receptors in gain of function uh, mutations in this protein, in the gene that encodes the protein PCSK9. So the liver also makes PCSK9. And the story there is that the same thing that elicits increased expression of the LDL receptor, that is reduced hepatic free cholesterol, also elicits increased production of PCSK9. So PCSK9 is secreted by the liver. It binds to this LDL-LDL receptor complex. And in that situation, following endocytosis, instead of the receptor uh, circulating back to the plasma membrane, the whole complex goes to a late endosome, uh, lysosomal compartment for degradation. This means the LDL receptor isn't free to recirculate. Uh, so that is why the uh, PCSK9 uh, inhibitors are very effective. So the PCSK9 uh, molecule has been very difficult to attack with a small molecule. Tom Lagasse, a scientist on the fourth floor, is working on a number of novel strategies, and there, we probably will have other therapies in the next few years, everything from antisense oligos to perhaps uh, uh, protein inhibitors. But the monoclonal antibodies work very well because they're very specific. So monoclonal antibody against PCSK9 basically will 
bind the circulating PCSK9, take it out of the picture, and so the LDL receptor is internalized without PCSK9, and we're back to the old paradigm where the LDL receptor circulates back to the plasma membrane. So these agents are very specific. So, you know, monoclonals have that advantage. They're, they're, not attack, they're not having effects on other systems. It just binds to PCSK9. And uh, we have, so far, good data. We're waiting for more exciting data in the next few months. Uh, this is Evolucumab Repatha and a couple of studies, a Laplace study, with for two, in the uh, patients already on a statin. And these agents can be given every two weeks or every four weeks, and the data are more or less the same. But oh, overall, across the board, about another 65% reduction in LDL cholesterol uh, in addition to statin therapy. And this is true in patients uh, uh, without familial hypercholesterolemia or patients with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, which is a population that often needs this treatment. And uh, alarucumab, uh, the Sanofi compound, progulant, uh, the data are very similar because alarucumab is originally, the, most patients start on the 75 milligram dose instead of 150. The uh, uh, average decrease in LDL was 50% rather than 65%, but this is really a question of dosing. And at the similar dose, they tend to be very similar. And we get the same effects in patients uh, on statin therapy patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, so very nice decreases there. So we are waiting for outcome data. Uh, these two papers were published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, about a year ago. So uh, for many of the studies of PCSK9, both from, uh, from, Sino from Amgen and from Sanofi Regeneron, uh, patients were started in various protocols, but then continued in this follow-up uh, study. So the also study for Evolucumab, Repatha, this is a, a mixed bag of patients. So some of them hadn't uh, been on other therapies, some had severe hypercholesterolemia. So without the addition of evolucumab, repatha, average LDL is 3.1, with the addition down to about 1.2. So this will be very similar to many of the patients who are actually going to treat with these agents. So residually high LDLs and high risk patients on, for the most part, on uh, other treatment. And although the study was not actually powered to look at events rates, over the subsequent uh, period, and that was actually just a little bit over a year, the patients on the PCSK9 inhibitor had about a 53% reduction in major events. But we have to remember the number of events were small, and uh, this was not uh, an RCT to look at uh, event rate. With the alarucumab, probably not uh, very, very similar uh, results uh, with their long-term study. LDL is going down from 3.17 to 1.5, and this is because some patients were not on the full dose at the end, but overall the average reduction was 62%, and really very similar. Not powered to look at events, but over a, about a one and a half year period, a 54% reduction in the events. So that looks very promising, but we are waiting for the two outcome studies. The Fourier study with evolucumab, uh, is actually complete, but the data not analyzed. So we expect that this study will be presented at the uh, ACC meeting in March. And these were high-risk uh, secondary prevention individuals, LDLs above 1.8 or non-HDL, total cholesterol minus HDL greater than 2.6. And uh, they were either on a dosing every two weeks or every four weeks. And the primary endpoint were the usual time to CV death, MI, hospitalization for unstable angina, stroke, or vascularization. So this will be the first study that comes out. Alarucumab, the Odyssey outcome study, will be just a little bit later, and maybe more relevant to some of us, because these are really high-risk patients. Individuals who'd been hospitalized for ACS within the last one to two months, uh, the LDL criteria, criterion was similar, LDL greater than 1.8. And uh, they were started on a smaller dose of the antibody 75, up traded to 150 as needed. So both of these studies will be very pertinent. We do have a study that's being uh, presented at uh, the AHA uh, in a few days. And this was the obvious regression study. So this was a uh, evolucumab uh, repatha study. So it was an IVIS study, and it uh, 
went on for a 78-week period. What we know now is that this, the outcome was positive. We have no idea how positive, but I think that this, you know, showing that there is regression over this period of time will really be quite exciting. And uh, as you know, with other earlier studies, the amount of regression by IVAS does uh, correlate with the reduction in clinical events. So uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, this was just an IVAS study. They were supposed to have OCT as well as IVAS, but that for some reason didn't pan out. So. We will know about this study very quickly. So what about prescribing PCSK9? Because this is what I'm supposed to talk about. So just want you to remember, they don't replace statins because they're the cornisone therapy. And they really statins plus azetamide is what you should start with in almost everybody. But we do have accumulating evidence, and we have a lot of good evidence that indeed lower is better, and lower than the guideline recommendation is better. And many high-risk individuals don't achieve these levels. So there's really a, an important role for these new therapies. Major issue is for the payers. So the cost is about $7,300 a year in Canada. We actually have the least expensive uh, PCSK9 in the world. In Europe, uh, it's about 7,000 euros, which at the current rate is uh, in excess of $10,000, more like $11,000 in the United States. 14,000 US, so that's about $20,000. So, uh, but you know, price has been an obstacle, but it's like all new therapies, I think the price will go down. So these are the choices that we have, and administering PCSK9 is really a piece of cake. So uh, although Repatha can be given every four weeks, and there, we will have a, a be able to prescribe this every four weeks. Because every four weeks is a three mil dose, it's really 50% more antibody. I don't really see the advantage of that for most patients. The dosing every two weeks really looks like an EpiPen and it's easy to use as an EpiPen. Uh, very simple. I don't think I've had anybody who really hasn't been able to figure it out. Uh, so uh, Repatha 140 every two weeks. With Prolulent, you can start with 75 and you kind of gear if this patient you know, you want LDL much lower, but not starting off with an LDL, perhaps above 375 may be adequate. So side effects are really minimal. Some patients have injection site reactions, but very, very rare. And of course, we don't have secondary effects the, the way uh, we may do with other medications. So the enrollment is straightforward. We have these forms in the clinic, whether for Repatha or Prolulent. And both of these uh, companies, uh, Sanofi and Amgen, have a program where, first of all, patients will sign this form and uh, you, you know, give a little bit of information on the background of the patient, their baseline LDLs, what they're on, what, what, whether they have heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia or whether they have coronary disease or it's often the case they have both. Then what happens when patients are enrolled in one of these two programs, a nurse will come to their house and show them how to use the pen. That isn't always necessary, but that does happen. But more importantly, uh, the Repatha Ready program or the uh, uh, Priolent program will work with the insurance company to try to ensure coverage. And this is really the obstacle for many patients because the hurdles include the fact that patients may have a drug plan, but they have a 20% deductible, sometimes more. They may have a cap on the drug plan. So of course, if it's $7,000 a year and the cap on their plan is 20,000, it's going to run out pretty quickly. Um, ODB has now agreed to cover uh, these agents for familial hypercholesterolemia, but not yet available because they're still sort of negotiating the price, which obviously is going to be less than the, uh, the uh, commercial price. So this is what you should expect. This is the most difficult part for us. So those uh, diagnoses, so the insurance companies want to know diagnosis. So for familial hypercholesterolemia, you're probably not familiar with them. There are very strict criteria. There are Simon Brun criteria, the Dutch Lipid Clinic criterion, uh, you know, tendons and thomata or shoe in, but a lot of patients with FH don't have tendons and thalmata. You want to show the baseline LDL without treatment was at least greater than six. If there's a family history of a monogenic uh, uh, inheritance of premature coronary disease. So that is difficult. ASCVD, so atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which is how it's been defined for uh, approval, very simple, but a lot of those companies don't cover ASCVD. 
particularly manual life, will you know cover FH. So there's there's wheeling and dealing, and it's maybe getting a little bit better than it was originally. Satin intolerance across the board is difficult to get covered. You really have to show the patient's been tried on on you know, two or three agents and you have to have data as to what happened. And often in tertiary care, we don't have that because the family doctor started the agent. I have been successful in getting coverage for PCSK9 in three patients who have congenital myopathy, such as McCardle syndrome. And in those individuals, they develop rhabdomyolysis as soon as you give them a statin. So, so some of these other diagnoses are easy to get covered. But many, drug plan, many of the drug plans will send you forms. They want to have lab reports on the previous therapies what was achieved, what dose they were on, what happened when they started the PCSK9, so there's lots of paperwork. Some of the drug plans will ask the patient to go back to the pharmacy and get records to show that they actually were taking the statin at the time that these lipids were measured. So, you know, the bar can be high, and that is really uh, what we're up against. So, I think this is the pyramid. Uh, most drug plans will cover familial hypercholesterolemia, which isn't all that rare. It's about 1 in 250 by recent calculations. And uh, a lot of these individuals have early coronary disease. A really important group are those with aggressive coronary disease despite maximum treatment. So coming in with you know, recurrent lesions, those ACS patients. And you know, really important to get many of these patients on additional therapy and Fortunately, coverage has been difficult, and it varies by the drug plan. And then I think as we go down, I mean, I think we'd probably like everybody with an LDL perhaps above two to be in something else. So this really gets down to the price of the agent, what we can afford as a society, and of course, this probably will change in the future as we have other therapies. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Happy to answer any questions.